Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So today we're going to talk about the integral, specifically Riemann's approach to computing the integral. So here we have in front of us a graph of a function f of x. That is the graph of x versus f of x. When we say the integral of f of x over a particular domain, uh, in this case the interval a to b, what we mean is the signed area under the curve or the graph of x versus f of x. When I say signed, what I mean is that the area could be positive or negative. If the area is below the x-axis, we would count it as negative. If it's above the x-axis, we would count it as positive. For this particular illustration, the function is positive on the interval a to b. It's above the x-axis, so all of the area is above the x-axis. So if this integral exists, spoiler alert, it does exist, it's positive. So we can see that that magenta area is in fact uh, should be computable. In other words, for this particular function, the integral should exist. Of course, the question we want to answer today is how do we know or when is this area computable? When does that number exist? And that's an important point that the integral of a function over a interval a to b, what's called a definite integral, is in fact a number, right? It's a number representing an area. When does this number exist and how is it computed? Right? What is the rigorous definition of the interval of f of x from a to b, right? Here we have in front of us a, an idea of what we're seeking, right? How do we give a rigorous uh, framework for this? Well, let's take a look at the function and the interval over which we're trying to compute an integral. And let's consider a partition of the interval a to b. Now, what is a partition? Well, it's just a set of points, x0, x1 through xn. It's a finite set of points where the first point is a. You see a equals x0. The last point is b. Here we have a partition for n equals 6. And every point in between is strictly greater than the one previous. So we have a strictly increasing set of points x1 is strictly greater than x0, x2 is strictly greater than x1, so forth and so on. This allows us to consider the function over subintervals of a to b. Now, for each of these subintervals, we could compute a supremum of f, not over the entire interval but over each subinterval. And we consider these supremums over the subintervals to be heights of rectangles. And if I were to sum up the area of the rectangles, right, I would get what's called an upper sum. Now, we can see from the pictures here that the upper sum is greater than or equal to the integral if the integral exists. Because I'm necessarily overestimating the area under the curve over each of these subintervals. Now, by the way, just a quick refresher on what supremum means. Supremum is the least upper bound of all upper bounds. It's the smallest one. Now if f is continuous as this function happens to be, we could replace supremum with maximum. Just to refresh your memory of why that is, we're computing the supremum over a closed subinterval. A closed interval is compact and a continuous function on a compact domain achieves both a min and a max. So if f were continuous, we could replace this supremum here with max. 
but we're not going to assume necessarily that f is continuous everywhere. So to be as general as possible, we'll say supremum. And this sum of rectangular areas for a particular partition is called an upper sum. And again, as we can see why, because we get a area that is greater than or equal to the integral if that integral area exists. So, just to reiterate, this formula is a sum of rectangular areas. The supremum of f on the subinterval is the height of the rectangle, and this xj plus 1 minus xj is the width. Here we see x3 minus x2 is the width of this particular rectangle, and we're adding up all of the rectangles. Now, of course, this particular partition doesn't give us too great of an idea of what the actual area under the curve is, right? if that area is a computable number. But imagine that we looked at every possible partition and took the smallest upper sum, or uh, to be precise, the infimum, that is, the greatest lower bound. Now, of course, we know that if the integral does exist, it's a lower bound. And one of the key questions is, is it the greatest lower bound? Is there a lower bound bigger than it? So if we imagine every possible partition, even partitions where the width of the subintervals uh, grow increasingly small or trend towards zero, if we took the smallest upper sum, then we have what's called what we're going to call big S. Big S for the smallest upper sum. And of course, big S is greater than or equal to the integral if the integral exists, if it exists. Now, is it greater than or is it equal to? By the way, this is also sometimes called the upper integral. So, We'll just refer to it as big S for now, but you'll see it also as the upper integral, the smallest possible upper bound for every possible partition. Now, we chose taking supremums over every subinterval, or we can think maximums for continuous functions. Uh, we also, for a partition, could look in each subinterval and take the infimum values or if f is continuous, the minimum values. Here we see the red dots denote the infimum value, or the min value, because here f actually is continuous, so it's a minimum. The minimum value of f in each subinterval. So we see the red dots are the min value. I could take those red dots as the height of rectangles and sum up the area of those rectangles. That would give me what's known as, well, you guessed it, a lower sum. And as you can see, this particular lower sum for this particular partition is less than the actual integral. And of course, the lower sum is always less than or equal to the integral if the integral exists. And in particular, the lower sum for a particular function and partition is always less than or equal to the upper sum. Now, for this particular partition, the lower sum is not a good idea of what the actual area under the curve is. But imagine, of all possible lower sums, I took the biggest one or to be more general, the supremum, that is the least upper bound of all upper bounds of lower sums. And remember, the integral itself, if it exists, is an upper bound. Is it the least upper bound? Right. right here, we're just looking at kind of random partition selections. But remember, this is the largest lower bound of all possible partitions. So we could think of a partition where a to B is divided into N 
even subintervals, and n goes off to infinity. Right? We could actually think of this as uh, kind of a limiting operation. So we've looked at two things that are computable, upper sums and lower sums. And of all possible upper and lower sums, we could take infimums and supremums respectively. By the way, the supremum of the lower sum is sometimes referred to as the lower integral. But if the lower integral and the upper integral are equal, in other words, if I take the biggest possible lower sum over every possible partition, and I took the largest upper sum over every, I'm sorry, the smallest upper sum over every possible partition, or to be general, the supremum of every lower sum over all partitions, and then femum of all upper sums over every partition, and if they are equal, then we say that in fact the function f is Riemann integrable on the interval a to b. And furthermore, the integral is equal to, that is the area under the curve, is equal to the supremum of the lower sums, which is equal to the infimum of the upper sums. Again, uh, it's right to think of the Riemann integral, or the integral, or the area under the curve as the smallest possible upper sum or the largest possible lower sum. And again, one way to think about it is just taking the interval a to b, cutting it into n subintervals, and letting n go off to infinity. There is uh, an idea of convergence under the hood here, and it's an idea that's important to applications such as, for example, quadrature. Quadrature is a numerical method for computing definite integrals. And from the name, you might imagine that right, quadrature, uh, it comes by using quadratures or quadrilaterals to approximate area under curves or sums of quadrilaterals. Over the year, it started this way, but over the years, it's gotten a bit more sophisticated than that. But whether these sums of quadrilaterals or more sophisticated ideas will converge to the actual area under the curve, if that even exists, that's an important question that applied mathematicians think about a lot. And it's related to this idea of when a function is said to be Riemann integrable. And now we know what that means. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about what kind of conditions will guarantee Riemann integrability, the arithmetic of integrals, and when Riemann integration goes wrong. That's all for now.